let's get started. Today we are going to, talk, uh, to continue our discussion regarding the basic steps for weight and absolute volume method. So last time we talked about the first step, which is evaluate the strength requirement. And we said that the strength is the most important factor in order to come up with mixed design. Today we are going to continue uh, our discussion regarding the basic steps. So today we are going to start with step number two. Uh, we want to learn how to determine the water cement ratio. So uh, in order to determine the water cement ratio, you need to know the value of FCR. Last time we learned how to determine the value of FCR from FC. So in order to know the water cement ratio, you need to know the value of FCR. You are going to use either this figure or that table. Also, you need to know whether your concrete is air entrained or it's non air entrained. Uh, if you do remember, the air entrained is the chemical admixtures. Uh, it's recommended to be used uh, when you have breathing and doing. So, in order to, to know the water cement ratio, you need to know the value of FCR and also you need to know whether your concrete is air entrained or non air entrained. In x axis, if you are going to use this figure, in x axis you have the water cement ratio. And in the y-axis, you have the compressive strength. I'm going to use this one in order to represent my FCR. Let's say that my FCR is 35 and my concrete is air in train. Then what is the value of the water cement ratio? If I'm going to use this figure here, I'm going to locate the value of uh, uh, FCR, which is 35 megapascal, which is here. Then I have two curves. I have the air in train and non air in train. Since my concrete is air in train, I'm going to draw a horizontal line. It's going to intersect with the air in train. Then I'm going to draw a vertical line. And then I'm going to uh, read the water cement ratio. For example, the water uh, cement ratio here, if my value is 35, uh, is going to be about 0.4. So if my FCR is 35 megapascal and my concrete is air entrained, then the value of the water cement ratio came out to be 0.4. If my concrete is non air entrained, this time I'm going to go here, my uh, 35 megapascal, then I'm going to draw a horizontal uh, line, then it's going to intersect with the non air entrained. Then I'm going to draw a vertical line and then I'm going to get the reading. It's going to be like 0.48. You can get the same result using the uh, this table, table 7.1. So here in this column, I have the compressive strength, the value, the value of FCR. Here I have the uh, a column for non-air entrained concrete and here for air entrained concrete. We are going to apply the same example. Assume the, the value of, of FCR is 35 megapascal. Uh, in the first case, I'm going to assume that my concrete is air in train concrete. Then here I have 35 megapascal. Then I'm going to skip this column because here I have non air in train and I'm going to choose this column which is air in train concrete. So the value of water cement ratio came out to be 0.4, the same as here. In other scenario, we are going to assume that my concrete is non air entrained and my value of uh, FCR is 35 megapascal. Then here I have 35 megapascal and here I can choose this column, not that column, because I have uh, non air entrained concrete and the value came out to be 0.48. You can ask yourself here, I don't have all the numbers. Let's say that what if my uh, uh, the value of FCR is 30 megapascal. In that case, what should I do? If your value is not listed here, you need to use interpolation. We learn how to use the interpolation from the lab. So you are going to use the interpolation or you can use the figure here. 
So after you get the uh, value of the water cement ratio, you need to check that value against the maximum allowable value. So we have maximum uh, allowable value for the water cement ratio, and that is going to depend on the uh, uh, exposure conditions. So here in this table, we are going to see the exposure conditions uh, in order to know the uh, maximum allowable water cement ratio. So from this uh, page here or from this step, I'm going to evaluate the value of the water cement ratio. But here I need to check my value against the maximum allowable water cement ratio. So I'm going to look at the exposure condition. And in this expo exposure here, the concrete is protected from exposure from, to freezing and doing, and also from application of the icing chemicals or aggressive substance. So if, if your case is this case, then you are going to use the value that you got it from here as it is. So uh, if your concrete is protected from all of this, then you are going to use the value as it is from here. That depends on the exposure conditions. I need to look at my exposure condition, uh, and then I'm going to uh, learn uh, the value of the uh, maximum allowable water cement ratio. If your exposure is, uh, uh, your concrete is protected from uh, freezing and doing an application of the icing chemicals or aggressive substance, we said that we are going uh, to uh, uh, use the value as it is from uh, this uh, figure or that table. If your uh, concrete is intended to have low permeability when exposed to water, then the maximum allowable water cement ratio is 0.5. So let's let's say I got the value here came out to be 0.6, and the maximum uh, allowable water cement ratio is 0.5. In that case, I'm not going to use 0.6 because the maximum allowable cement ratio is 0.5. I'm going to use 0.5. But if your value is 0.4 and the maximum allowable uh, water cement ratio is 0.5, in this case, I'm going to use 0.4. Uh, also, sometimes your uh, exposure condition is the concrete exposed to freezing and doing in moist condition and the icers. In that case, the maximum allowable water cement ratio is 0.45. You should not use a value more than this value. Also, if your concrete is reinforced concrete, not concrete, reinforced concrete, exposed to colorites from the icing salts, salts, water, uh, brackish water, sea water, or spray from these sources, then your maximum allowable water cement ratio is going to be 0.4. Also, I have another table for the maximum allowable water cement ratio in case you have sulfate, sulfate attack. Remember the sulfate attack, we can get sulfate attack from the soil or, or from the ground water. And uh, if you do remember in cement type 2, uh, we have the moderate uh, sulfate attack in case that you have uh, moderate sulfate attack and also cement type 5 we have the severe uh, sulfate attack so the sulfate is is important so i need to check my uh, uh, my uh, soil and my water for the value of the sulfate so here in this table is going to give you the value of your sulfate so if your sulfate within this value and that value then you are going to say that we have moderate sulfate exposure if your uh, value of the sulfate in the soil and, and in the water uh, less than 0.1 here uh, percentage by weight and here is less than 150 ppm in this case the sulfate exposure is negligible you are going to ignore the uh, sulfate exposure uh, similarly here in this case and similar here in that case so it depends on the uh, values in the soil the, the value of the uh, soluble uh, sulfate in the soil and also in the water, I'm going to, de 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 to determine uh, the level of ex exposure regarding the uh, sulfate. So I have negligible, I have moderate, I have uh, severe, and I have very severe. So here I have the maximum water cement ratio, the allowable maximum cement, uh, water cement ratio. So if you're, let's say that your uh, uh, concrete is exposed to severe sulfate exposure. In this case, the maximum allowable water cement ratio is going to be 0.45.
and you should use type 5 this one is type 5 and also if you're for example uh, if your con uh, concrete is exposed to moderate sulfate exposure you should use cement type 2 and the maximum water cement ratio it should be 0 0.5 of course we are going to have example after we explain all the steps uh, even if it's not clear here uh, the when we are going to solve example is going to be uh, clearer step number three we need to determine the course aggregate requirements so in the first step we determine the uh, strength requirement we manage to get the value of FCR and in step number two we determine the uh, the value of the water cement ratio and we say that we need to check that value against the allowable water cement ratio and that is uh, is going to depend on the exposure conditions now in step three we need to determine the value of the course aggregate we need to know the course aggregate requirements so before that before I know the uh, uh, value of the course aggregate I need to know the characteristics of the aggregate itself so we know that from chapter 5 uh, uh, which which is about aggregate we know that larger aggregate uh, minimize the amount of water required and therefore uh, reduce the amount of the cement required per cubic meter uh, of mix so if you are going to use large aggregate then your mix is going to be economical because you are going to use less amount of cement. Also, if your aggregate is round aggregate, which means that it's going to uh, require less water and the workability is going to be better as opposed to uh, angular aggregate for an equal workability. But most importantly, we need to know the maximum allowable aggregate size. Remember, we, uh, we have two definitions. We have the traditional definition and we have the super prep definition we have the maximum aggregate size and we have the the uh, minimum uh, nominal maximum aggregate size so first before I, I determine the amount of the course aggregate I need to know uh, the value of the maximum aggregate size and the maximum aggregate size is limited by the dimension of the structure why because if your aggregate is too big then the aggregate is going to stuck while you are going to place the concrete and that is going to create a problem you are going to have a lot of voids so i need to check the maximum aggregate size against all of this again is the form dimension again is the clear spacing between reinforcement we call this the spacing between rebars and also you need to check the value of the maximum aggregate size again is the clear space between reinforcement and the form we call this cover and also you need to check the value of the maximum aggregate size again is the unreinforced slab so if your uh, maximum uh, aggregate size is suitable then it should be less than one-fifth of the uh, uh, minimum dimension of the minimum clear distance and it also should be less than three over four of the minimum clear spacing the cover and also should be less than three over four of the minimum clear spacing and also should be less than one third of the thickness so in order to understand this I'm going to show you this example so in this example I have a structure is to be built with concrete so I'm going to use concrete in order to build a structure the minimum dimension is 0 0.2 meter so for the structural element inside the that structure the minimum dimension is 0 0.2 meter and the minimum uh, space between rebars is 40 millimeter and also the minimum cover over rebars is uh, of 40 millimeter so now I have the minimum dimension I know the spacing and I know the minimum cover then uh, I want to uh, use a suitable coarse aggregate so I look uh, at the market and they say that two types of aggregate are locally available the first one with a size of 90 millimeter uh, maximum aggregate size and the second one with 25 millimeter maximum aggregate size so I have two types Th type one uh, it has uh, 90 millimeter uh, maximum aggregate size and the second one it has 25 millimeter maximum aggregate size so which one should I use which one is going to be uh, uh, best uh, for me the general rule here uh, if the uh, maximum aggregate size is bigger that means the mix is going to be economical 
but I need to check the value of the maximum aggregate size against all of these. So he give me the form dimension, the minimum uh, dimension, and also he give me the spacing and he give me the uh, cover. Uh, he didn't uh, uh, give any information regarding the thickness because uh, it seemed like the, in this example he is going to use reinforced concrete, not unreinforced concrete. So I'm going to check the value. We say that I'm going to check again it's this value and this value and that value. So I'm going to try the uh, bigger one because this one is better. Uh, so I'm going to check 25 millimeter again it's this and this and this. So 25 came out to be less than one fifth of the 200 millimeter. This one is the represent the minimum dimension and also came out to be less than one third of the repair spacing. And also it came out to be less than uh, three of, uh, over four of the uh, uh, value of the uh, rebar cover. So if this one is going to uh, satisfy the requirements, it means that 19 millimeter is also going to satisfy the requirements as well. So in this case, which one is better? The 25 millimeter aggregate is more suitable uh, because it will produce a more econ economical concrete mix. Okay, then once you know the maximum aggregate size, you will be able to determine the nominal maximum aggregate size because the nominal maximum aggregate size is one, uh, is one sieve smaller than the maximum aggregate size. So if this one is 25 millimeter, it means that the nominal maximum aggregate size is 19 millimeter. So now, in this step, we uh, managed to check the value of the uh, uh, maximum aggregate size, and also we, uh, uh, we get the value of the nominal maximum aggregate size. Now we are in position in order to determine the course aggregate requirement. So in this table, we are going to get a factor. That factor is going to be multiplied by the unit weight of the course aggregate. Remember, in lab number one, we managed to determine the unit weight. Whether it loose, we have loose unit weight and we have rotted unit weight. So also, we need I need to know the value of the dry rotted unit weight of the course aggregate. So uh, in the uh, previous step, uh, we learn how to get the value of the nominal maximum size of the aggregate. We already know this now. And also we need we need to know the value of the dry rotted unit weight of the coarse aggregate. And also we need to know the finest modulus. Remember the finest modulus? We learn how to determine the finest modulus. So if you know the nominal maximum size of the aggregate, and also you know the finest modulus, you will be able to determine a factor. This factor is going to multiply by the dry unit weight, and the result represent the course aggregate amount. So how I'm going to use this table, let's say that the uh, nominal maximum size came out to be 19, and the modulus, uh, finest modulus came out to be 2.6. Then the factor is going to be 0.64. Then what should I do with that factor? I'm going to multiply that factor with the value of the dry rotted unit weight. And the answer is the, uh, the mass of the course aggregate. So now we finish from step number three. We are going to go to step number four, which is the air entrainment requirement. Remember the air entrainment? We are going to put air entrainment as chemical admixtures in order, uh, uh, in order to uh, fight the effect of the freezing zoning conditions and the icing salts. So, uh, in order to uh, determine the amount of the air entrainment, I need to know the exposure levels. I have three uh, levels. I have the mild exposure, I have moderate exposure, and I have severe exposure. If you have mild exposure, it means that indoor or outdoor surface in which concrete is not exposed to freezing and zooming, uh, to freezing and de-icing salts. So in this case, if I'm going to have mild exposure, it means that my concrete is not exposed to freezing or the icing salts. So what is the purpose of the air entrainment in this case? In this case, air entrainment may be used to improve the workability only. In the second exposure, I have the moderate exposure. So if I have moderate exposure, it means that some freezing exposure occurs, some freezing, but concrete is not exposed to moisture or 
free water for long periods prior to freezing. It means also the concrete is not exposed to the icing salts. So if this is your case, then it means that my exposure is moderate exposure. The last one, which is a severe exposure, it means that the concrete is exposed to the icing salts, saturation or free water. Example include pavement, bridge de the, uh, decks, uh, curbs, gutters, canal uh, lingerings. So uh, I need to know uh, which one is my exposure levels, whether it's mild exposure or moderate exposure or severe exposure. Then once I know my uh, 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 exposure condition, I'm going to go to this uh, table here. I need to know the nominal maximum aggregate size. Uh, remember, most, most of these properties, most of these steps depends on the nominal maximum aggregate size. So I need to know the nominal maximum aggregate size and also I need to know the exposure condition. In the first case, I don't have any uh, air entrainment. So the uh, air entrainment, uh, the, the volume of air entrainment expected is going to be uh, one of these values, depends on the nominal maximum aggregate size. So let's assume again, my nominal maximum aggregate size is 19 millimeter, and my exposure condition is moderate exposure. In this case, uh, I'm, I'm going, uh, I need to have 5% volume of the air entrainment. So we need to, uh, 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 to enter 5% of the air entrainment inside my concrete. Of course, in order to get exact value is difficult. So here they say that we, we have a range. The range is going to be minus one of this value and plus two. So if the value came out to be five, it means that my range is between four and 7%. Okay. So uh, uh, this is all about the air entrainment in order to know the volume of the air entrainment. The value here uh, represent the uh, volume of the air entrainment inside my concrete. In order to get this value, I need to know the nominal maximum aggregate size, and also I need to know the exposure condition, condition whether it's mild exposure or moderate exposure or severe exposure. So next. talking about the workability requirements. So what does it mean by workability? Workability is defined as the ease of placing, consolidating, and finishing uh, freshly mixed concrete. So workability is how easily I can handle the concrete. And my concrete should be workable, but should not segregate or excessively bleed. Bleeding is a process which means that the migration of water to the top of the surface of the concrete. So if you are going to uh, consolidate the concrete a lot more than required, then bleeding is going to take place, which means that the water is try to go to the top of the surface of the concrete. And how to uh, assess the workability? In order to evaluate the workability, we are going to conduct the slump test, which, we, which is something we discussed uh, uh, in the previous uh, lab. So in the uh, slum test, we are going to uh, pour the concrete in the uh, truncated cone, like this one, and then we are going to release that cone, uh, and then we are going to compare the, uh, uh, the, the, the difference in the uh, heights. So the difference is defined by the slum. And the slum is increased by adding water, if you are going to increase the amount of water, this difference is going to increase, or if you add air and train, also th this difference is going to increase. And also if you add water reducer, like a plasticizer, also the, uh, the slum is going to increase. Or if you are going to use round aggregates, also the slum is going to increase. Uh, here in this table, table 7.7, .7, we have recommended value for the uh, uh, slum. We have recommended value for the slum. It depends on the structural element. If you have reinforced foundation walls and footings, then the slum should be a maximum 75 millimeter or three inches, and minimum should be 25 millimeter or one inch. If your structural element is plain footing, 
uh, caissons and uh, uh, substructure walls. The maximum should be 75 and the minimum should be 25 millimeter. If your structural element is beam and reinforced walls, the maximum amount of, for the slump should be 100 millimeter and the minimum should be 25 millimeter. Uh, uh, similarly, regarding the building columns, while the pavement and slabs and the mass concrete, similar to the first case, which means that the maximum slum should be 75 millimeter and the minimum should be 25 millimeter. The value here between the bracket represent uh, the uh, measurement by inches. So uh, uh, it depends on my structural element. Then I need to uh, pick up, uh, choose a value between the maximum and the minimum. Then the value that I will going to choose as slump value, then the, the amount of the water is going to depend on that value. So in the next step, we are going to determine the water content. So in order to determine the water content, the water content depends on the slump mainly. So the slump that you are going to uh, choose from here, you are going to use, you are going to use it in order to determine the water content. Also, uh, the water content depends on the nominal maximum size and depends on the shape of the aggregates and whether the concrete is air entrained or not. So look at uh, table 7.8. In table 7.8, here I have the value of the slump, and here I have the value of the uh, nominal maximum aggregate size. And uh, for this part here, the concrete should be non-air entrained, while this part here, the concrete is air entrained. So first, I need to uh, choose whether my concrete is non-air entrained or air entrained. If it's air entrained, for example, I'm going to use this part. If it's non-air entrained, I'm going to use that part. Then I'm going to uh, know the value of the slump. Let's say that the slump is between 25 to 50 millimeter. And also assume that the nominal maximum size is 19. In that case, the water content is going to be 190 kilogram per cubic meter. Again, the value between the bracket here represent the uh, uh, pound per cubic yard. So this value represents the kilogram per cubic meter. And this is the value of the water content. So in order to determine the water content, I need to know whether my concrete is air entrained or non air entrained. Also, I need to know the value of the slump. And also, I need to know the nominal maximum aggregate size. Like you can notice here, uh, all the values depends on the nominal maximum aggregate size. So it's very important to know the nominal maximum aggregate size. And uh, here we say that the water content depends on the size and the shape of the aggregates. In this table, we are going to assume that the aggregate is angular coarse aggregate, which means that it's crushed stone. And we know that uh, you could use, for example, uh, 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 round gravel, or you could use gravel with crushed particles, and also you could use subangular. So in this table, they assume that the aggregate is angular coarse aggregate. So what if I have round aggregate? If you have round aggregate, then you are going to uh, uh, reduce the value which you got from here from 27 kilogram per cubic meter. Because the values here depends on angular coarse aggregate. So if your aggregate is different from this one here, you are going to reduce the value there. So let's say that our value came out to be 190 uh, kilogram per cubic meter. Then we are going to reduce the value. Uh, uh, we are going to use uh, a water content equal to 27 kilogram per cubic meter if you are going to use round aggregate, which means that the, the final water content is going to be uh, uh, 190 minus 27. Assume that your aggregate is subangular. In that case, your value is going to be 190 minus 12. So you need to uh, reduce the amount of the water if you are if you are going to use uh, a type of uh, aggregate different than the angular coarse aggregate. Then in step number seven, we are going to determine the cementing materials content. Now in this step, we determine the water cement ratio from step number two. You do remember that. And from the previous step, we determine the water content. 
So now we know the water content and we know the water cement ratio. So if you do know the, these values, then the water, uh, the, uh, the value of the uh, cement is going to be uh, the water, the value of the water over the uh, water cement ratio. So the weight of the cement, since I know the uh, water uh, content and I know the weight of cement ratio, I can use this formula in order to determine the weight of the cement. But we have conditions on the uh, uh, weight of the cement. We have minimum value for the uh, cement content. So it depends on the exposure condition. If your concrete is exposed to severe freeze zooming or the ice source and sulfate exposure, then the minimum cement content should be 334 kilogram per cubic meter. So let's say that I uh, use this formula and the weight of the cement came out to be 300 kilogram per cubic meter. But my concrete is exposed to severe uh, freeze and zoo. In that case, I'm not going to use 300 kilogram per cubic meter uh, because the value is less than the minimum cement content, which is 334 kilogram per cubic meter. So I'm going to use this value instead. Also, if your concrete is going to be placed under the water, the minimum value should be 3. Uh, 85 kilogram per cubic meter so you you are not going to use a, 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 a value less than this value or that value of your concrete exposed to this uh, severe freeze in doing or your concrete is uh, placed under the water also in table 7.5 if you are going to uh, pour concrete in flat work like the slab the slab is flat in this case i have uh, this table which is going to provide a minimum requirement for the cement content and again it depends on the nominal maximum size of the aggregate let's say that my nominal maximum size of aggregate is 19 then the minimum value should be used should be uh, 320 uh, kilogram per cubic meter so if you use this formula and the value came out to be 300 kilogram and you are going to uh, 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 pour concrete into a slab in this case, the minimum value should be 320 kilogram per cubic meter. So if your value came out to be 300 kilo, kilogram per cubic meter, then you are going to use this value instead because 300 kilogram per cubic meter is less than the minimum requirement. Uh, in step number eight, uh, we are going to talk about the admixture requirements. Sometimes we are going to use uh, admixtures in order to uh, uh, improve the uh, behavior uh, or the properties of the concrete, whether it's uh, fresh uh, uh, properties or hardened properties. Uh, in this case, in order to know uh, the value or the quantity of the admixtures, we need to look at the admixture. Manufacturers uh, should provide specific information on the quantity of the uh, admixtures. So I need to follow uh, the uh, recommendation uh, uh, of the admixture manufacturers. And, uh, uh, and once I know the amount that I should add to the concrete, this uh, amount uh, should be considered in the mixed proportioning. So once I know the amount of the admixtures, then that uh, amount should be considered uh, in the mixing proportioning. Now we are going to talk about step number nine. Step number nine is very important step because in step number nine, uh, the uh, uh, volume, uh, absolute vo volume method, and the weight volume method will differ. Okay, we said that the uh, in order to uh, use the weight method and the absolute volume method, they are going to follow the same steps, except step number nine. In step number nine, we are going to determine the uh, fine aggregate requirements. So in step number nine, the uh, the Bose method will differ. So at this point, we determine the uh, uh, water uh, content, we determine the cement co content, and also we determine the dry coarse aggregate per uh, cubic meter. Uh, and uh, they are known, and the volume of air is estimated in step number uh, four, I think. We estimated the volume of the air. The only remaining factor is the amount of the dry fine aggregates. So now, in step number nine, the only remaining is the uh, fine aggregate, the sand. So 
First, we are going to discuss how to determine the fine aggregate using the weight method. We are going to use the weight method. In the weight method, we are going to use table 7.10. So this table is only for the weight method, not for the absolute volume method. And in this table, we are going to estimate the total weight of the typically fr freshly mixed concrete. So the value here represent, represent the weight, the total weight of the uh, uh, fresh concrete. And also, again, in this table, I need to know the value of the nominal maximum aggregate size. And also, I need to know whether my concrete is non-air entrained or air entrained. Let's assume that my concrete is air entrained and my nominal maximum aggregate size is 19. In this case, the, uh, uh, the total weight of the concrete is going to be uh, 22,076 kilogram per cubic meter. So this one represents the value of the uh, weight of the concrete. So if I know the uh, weight of the concrete and I know all of this, the water, the cement, and the dry aggregate, I can get the uh, uh, weight of the fine aggregate by sub subtracting the weight of the other ingredients from the total weight. So if you are going to use the weight method, then I'm going to, in step number nine, I'm going to use table 7.10. I need to estimate the uh, total weight of the concrete. And then in order to get the value of the fine aggregate, I'm going to subtract the weight of all the in ingredients from the total weight. If you are going to use the absolute volume method, in this case, you are going to use the, uh, uh, the weight and the specific gravity to determine the volume. So if you are going to use the absolute volume method, you are going to use the volumes relationship in order to determine the uh, uh, weight of the fine aggregate. We are, we are going to say that the volume of the concrete is going to uh, be uh, the volume represent the volume of the water plus the volume of, volume of the cement plus the volume of the air plus the volume of the coarse aggregate and plus uh, the volume of the fine aggregate. Then we are going to assume that the volume of the concrete is one cubic meter of the concrete. So you are going to say that uh, I'm going to design for one uh, cubic meter. Then in this case, the volume of the fine aggregate is going to be equal one minus the volume of the water, minus the volume of the cement, minus the volume of the air, minus the volume of the coarse aggregate. So you are going to say that how I'm going to determine the volume of the water, for example. We know that the specific gravity for any material is going to be the uh, density of that material over the density of the water, right? And the density of the material represents the weight of the material over the volume of the material. So I'm going to put the volume of the material, uh, uh, I'm going to solve for, for the volume of the material, then the volume of the material is going to be the weight of the material over the specific gravity time the uh, gamma water. Uh, and by doing this, I'll be able to determine the volume of the uh, water and the cement and the air and the coarse aggregate. When we are going to solve an example, you are going to see this. Now, in step number 10, we are going to talk about the moisture corrections. In the mixed design, we are going to assume that the water used to hydrate the cement is a free water only. If you do remember, we talked about the conditions of the uh, aggregates. We have oven dry, oven dry aggregate, which means that we have the moisture correction. Uh, we are going to assume that the water used to hydrate the cement is a free water. Uh, remember the uh, conditions of the aggregate. We have oven dry, we have air dry, we have SSD condition, and we have the moist, moist condition. Uh, we are going to say that the, uh, uh, our aggregate is not air dry and is not moist. Because if your aggregate is air dry, that means uh, uh, this part is going to absorb uh, water from the mixing water and if your condition is the moist in this case uh, your aggregate is going to add a water into the mixing water okay so we are going to assume that the water content uh, we're not going to uh, give water to the uh, uh, aggregate or get water from the aggregate that is why we need to adjust the values of the uh, 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 moisture content therefore 
the final step in the mixed design process is to adjust the weight of water. We need to adjust the weight of the water and also the weight of the aggregates to account for the existing moisture content of the aggregates. Because when we got the aggregates, we assume that the aggregate is dry aggregate. So if the moisture content of the aggregate is more than SSD, like this case here, okay? So in this case, the weight of the mixing water is reduced by an amount equal to the free weight of the moisture on the aggregate. So if your aggregate is moist, like this one, which means that I have a, a, a excess amount of water, like this one, then I need to reduce the amount of the mixing water. And that uh, value it should be equal to the excess amount of water. And if your water, similarly, if your uh, moisture content is below the SSD condition, like this one here, like the air uh, dry, like this one, in this case, the mixing water should be increased. I need to increase the mixing water so that I'm going to account for the water which is going to be absorbed by the aggregate. So let's see this example in order to understand this process. In this table, we are going to adjust the weight of the water and the aggregates to account for the existing moisture content of the aggregates. Okay, so I have the mass of the coarse aggregate and I have the mass of the fine aggregate. This value here represents the amount of the coarse aggregate. And again, the values that we have uh, estimated from uh, step number three and step number nine, we are going to say that those values are uh, from dry density. So those value is uh, from oven. It's dry. Then we determine the absorption for the coarse aggregate and the moisture content for the coarse aggregate. Similarly, we have done the same thing for the absorption for the fine aggregate and from the uh, for the moisture content in the SSD condition in this condition okay and uh, this value represent the weight of the water over the dry weight of the aggregate and the moisture content is the actual moisture content again uh, is going to equal the weight of the water over the uh, uh, dry weight of the aggregate. First, we need to correct the mass of the aggregate. The mass here is dry, but we need to put the effect of the water. The moisture content represents the actual, the actual moisture content. Uh, for example, here the uh, moisture content, the actual moisture content, came out to be 2.3%. So in order to get the weight of the uh, uh, water, I'm going to multiply the moisture content by the dry weight because the moisture content is the weight over dry weight. So if I'm going to multiply this by the dry weight, I'm going to get the uh, uh, amount of the water. So I'm going to correct the mass of the coarse aggregate uh, by multi multiply this value by the uh, weight or the mass of the coarse aggregate. Uh, and that is going to give me the weight of the water and then I'm going to add that to the uh, uh, dry uh, weight. So this value plus this value times 2 over 3. Uh, you're going to divide it by 100 because this one is a percent. And then the answer will, will came out to be 2,088. Similarly, we are going to do the same for the fine aggregate. Here I have the moisture content. Uh, the mass with the moisture corrected uh, value is going to be the dry weight plus the dry weight times uh, 4.5 over 100. And the answer came out to be 1065. So now we corrected the uh, mass of the coarse aggregate and the finer aggregate to account for the uh, uh, weight of the water. Now we need to determine the uh, free moisture. Here is the absorption and here is the moisture content. Since the value of the uh, moisture content, the actual uh, water content, uh, is 2.3 and this one is 0 0.8, it means that I have free water because this value is more than the absorption. So is the SSD condition, the absorption, and the value of the uh, uh, actual came out to be more than this one. So it means that I have a moist aggregate, not air dry aggregate, which means that I'm going to have free water. So in order to determine the free water or the free moisture, 
I'm going to subtract the uh, value of the absorption from the value of the moisture content and then should be multiplied by the mass of the coarse aggregate. Similarly, I'm going to do the same for the uh, 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 fine aggregate. This value, uh, this value minus that value multiplied by the dry weight of the fine aggregate. For the coarse aggregate, the answer came out to be 31, while for the fine aggregate, the answer came out to be 29. So I have the uh, this value plus that value came out to be 60. So I have uh, 60 kilogram per cubic meter uh, total excess moisture. So I have uh, water more than the SSD condition uh, equals 60. Then I need to subtract this value from the water content that we have got uh, previously. So I need to subtract this value here because if I didn't uh, subtract this value, then the uh, aggregate is going to add uh, water for the uh, mixing water. So in step number 11, after I compute all the uh, ingredients, uh, the gravel, the sand, uh, the water, the cement, the admixtures, then I need to uh, make three uh, cylinders. The dimension of the cylinders, the diameter is uh, 0.15, while the height is 0.15. 3 meter and should be cured for 28 days and then we are going to test the compressive strength also i need to measure the air content the slump uh, of the fresh concrete and if the uh, slump or the air content or the compressive strength does not meet the requirement then the mixture should be adjusted so i need to adjust my admixtures and do the process again and then uh, i need to make trial mixes to make sure that but my result is going to meet the requirement.